Right. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Alexander Lim, and this is Author Story, where we speak to different authors and their particular topics of interest. On today's episode is Janae Paylat, the author of Living an Orgasmic Life, Heal Yourself and Awaken Your Pleasure. And you can check her book out right now via the Amazon link in the video description below. As for Janae herself, she was a successful corporate healthcare executive and Broadway producer with which, on the surface, she also had a great family and home. But she found no joy in sex and intimacy until she healed herself sexually. She now lives in San Francisco and works as a certified tantra educator, sexological body worker, and somatica trained sex coach. So, Janae, welcome. Great to have you with us on Author Story. Thank you, Alex. Delighted to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. So, Janae, first off, what made you decide to write Living an Orgasmic Life? Hmm, such a great question. You know, I think that I realized that there was a story inside of me that I had to write about my own experiences around my sexuality and my marriage and my upbringing and my relationships. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I did, it's not like I was necessarily intending to write this book. I actually did a, a vision board. And at the top of the vision board, the title was, uh, living an orgasmic life. And then I was like, oh, I think that's actually the title of a book that I'm going to write. So oh, okay. <laughs> it sort of happened kind of organically that way. Okay. So, so there was like no single aha moment and you realized, you know, I should write this book. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I had, you know, I felt like I had a pretty unusual journey and transition from being a lawyer and a healthcare executive to a sex and intimacy coach. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a moment where I did say, yes, like this, this is a book, you know, I felt, I certainly felt, and I still feel like I had an important message that I really wanted to bring out into the world mm -hmm. and that um, the writing a book would be a great way to be able to put that message forth in a very sort of comprehensive way so that you could see the whole journey from the beginning all the way to where I am now. All right. Okay. Okay. Great. And I know this government book, but I'd like to touch a little bit in your career path. I mean, you were full on the corporate and uh, the stage thing, and then you became a sex coach, <laughs> which is a big shift. Uh, how did right. that happen? It's amazing. I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder myself, but really, I felt like I was called to it. So, you know, the background of my story was, yes, I was living this, you know, amazing life in New York City, um, practicing law and doing corporate work uh, with a husband and kids. Um, uh, and on the outside, everything looked great. But inside, I knew there were a lot of issues that um, I was actually really struggling with sexuality. I had sex was really painful for me. So my husband and I rarely had sex and it was really kind of a disaster for us. And it, it caused us, it's one of the things that caused the marriage to break apart, albeit not for a very long period of time because we stayed together for 25 years, but we were in a sexless marriage for almost 10 or 12 of those years. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, which is not uncommon, by the way. It's not at all uncommon, unfortunately. Like 25% of people are in sexless marriages. Um, and uh, when I knew I was getting, when, when I knew I had to leave this marriage and move on with my life, and we both agreed that, you know, it was amicable, I realized I had to take a look at what was going on with my sexuality because I knew I wanted to be in a relationship again and I knew that this would prevent me from being in another one. Right. Um, and so I took a deep dive into, into myself and I um, happened to meet somebody in New York who happened to do a little bit of Tantra mm -hmm. uh, and he turned me on to um, Tantra and sacred sexuality and that was a completely different experience for me around sex and sexuality and, um, and it was very, very powerful. Mm. And I realized, you know, over that short period of time, like, oh, this is this may be a doorway to healing. And the more I got into it, the more I realized like this, this is the reason why I've been miserable for 25 years. Like right. I'm supposed to go out in the world <clears throat> and help other people who are who were in my situation. And that was really the transition. It, in my in my head it, and it wasn't like an, an aha moment it was just like I don't like what I'm doing anymore it doesn't feel passionate it doesn't feel purposeful I was put on this earth to do something special aha this is what it was all right right okay okay I got that now on to the topic I mean there's 
I mean, it's well known like there's there's a lot of stuff on the internet, you know, and there's a lot of sex right out there in the world right now that's available that can be viewed, but uh, women still aren't living uh, a life of I don't know how to call it sexual freedom. Yeah. Uh, why would you think this is so? Um, I think the reason we're still not living a, a life of sexual freedom is because of that word shame mm. that is, you know, so, so much a part of our culture. It's like exactly what you said, Alex. It's like everything is about sex, mm. you know, right. sex sells, etc. But yet we have this cultural shame that are, is not our belief system, mm. but has been passed down from generation to generation and this just huge discomfort around sexuality and, and those beliefs, you know, that, that's powerful stuff that happens at a very young age, the way in which we, we shame our children and we've been shamed ourselves. And that makes us close down and not mm -hmm. feel comfortable with our bodies and not feel comfortable with our sexuality. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that brings up two things, because I mean, uh, well, first off, let me ask, can you give an example of the kind of shaming that happens early in life that, you know, gets carried on into into adulthood? Yeah, absolutely. So let's say that um, a little boy, he's like maybe four or five years old, is like, you know, touching his penis as little kids do, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the parent comes and just like slaps his hand, mm -hmm. right? So immediately he starts to get the message, oh, if I touch myself, that's bad. Mm -hmm. Pleasure is bad, right? So that's mm -hmm. just a very simple and very common experience that we have. Um, and that can absolutely, you know, have a major impact on people. And then there are even more direct ways or even more subtle ways in which we get those messages. Like a lot of my clients, they don't see their parents touch each other or kiss each other mm -hmm. or hold each other. And so therefore they go into relationships and they have a hard time with physical touch and mm -hmm. intimacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, you know, it's, um, it, it's a popular notion that say women, a woman or women don't enjoy sex or sexuality or intimacy because they've been abused, but apparently this is not the case, is it? Um, no, one in four women have been sexually abused or had okay. some sort of sexual trauma. So that's right. actually very true. Okay. All um, right. So that may be, in fact, you know, that that may be one of the wounding um, that women have around their sexuality, that sex isn't safe or men aren't safe. And a lot of men have been abused as well. Right. right so it's, right. it's, you know, both, both sides of the spectrum. So right. I do think abuse and trauma have had an impact for mm -hmm. sure. Like right. that's that can be very, very, very powerful. Right. But it's not the only thing. Yeah. But I mean, well, what I guess I wanted to say was that that's not the only thing that keeps uh that keeps women or even men from enjoying sex and sex and intimacy. No, no, definitely not. I mean, there's all these other factors that come into play, like the messages that we received around sex um, for women feeling like, you know, they have to please their partner. Mm -hmm. So women, you know, a lot of women have a hard time putting their needs first. They put their partner's needs first. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they may not get the, the pleasure that they want or they're not comfortable asking for what they want or mm -hmm. they don't even know what they want because they haven't explored their body, maybe because ah. they have shame around masturbation right. and touching themselves, right? There's a lot right. of shame, a lot of genital shame for women in particular. Right, right, okay. Uh, all right, so, um, I think you mentioned that women are programmed to say no to sex. Is this biological programming or is this, as you mentioned, uh, influences due to society and culture? Oh, yeah. I, I don't think it's biological at all. In fact, women have, you know, women have a clitoris, right? And the only purpose a clitoris has is to give a woman pleasure. It has no part in, you know, having a baby or reproduction. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the culture programs women to say no to sex. So, mm -hmm. you know, example is compared to men, like men are like told to go out and sow your wild oats, right? Mm -hmm. Just don't get her pregnant. Just don't get right. an STD, right? right There's right. like a high five in the locker room. Women are told like, keep your leg shut, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Don't get pregnant. Like all that boys want is to, um, you know, get into your pants, right? So they're very right. different messages that that the that we give uh, girls and boys in their in their teenage years. Okay, and you know this 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 carries on to adulthood. Like like you mentioned that example with the boy touching his penis in childhood, then this gets added on in uh, in adolescence and all that stuff. So it really does it really does add up, particularly for women. 
Yeah, it, it really does add up, especially for women, because women get so many more of the cultural messages um, around sex. And like even, you know, women will tell me like, I've been told not to have sex, not to have sex, not to have sex until I get married. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I get married, I'm supposed to be some sexual goddess, but I have no experience and I still feel like sex is bad and right. shameful, right? Yeah. Like it's such a dichotomy to, to be able to go from those two opposites. Right, right, okay. And, and I mean, it's just like uh, you're like this one way for most of your life and then suddenly you gotta switch and it's a big change. It's a really, really big change. And it doesn't like happen overnight. You know, mm. there's there's a process of like unlayering all of the shame. And for me, it was unlayering like the anxiety and unla mm. unlayering the fact that I felt disconnected from my body, which is another reason why women don't enjoy sex. Mm -hmm. We're so much more anatomically disconnected from our body and our mm -hmm. pleasure centers than men are. And what do you mean by that? Disconnected from this being disconnected from one's body? Yeah, so I'll give you I'll give you a great example, right? So right. when when um, adolescent boys are going through puberty, they get erections mm -hmm. because that you wear your sex organs on the outside of your body, so you start to associate. Oh, there's a hot woman. Oh, look at that, my penis is getting erect. Right. Pleasure, right. right? For women, like we don't have that. All of our erectile, I call it the erectile network, is inside our body, mm -hmm. right? So there's no, there's, there's not a part of us that brushes up against something for most women, right, and all right. of a sudden starts to feel pleasure. So there's right. a big disconnection right there, right? Internal versus external. Right. Okay. And is this like the only? All right. Okay. So that that's interesting because yeah, I mean there's. If you don't see it, and, and particularly if you don't feel it, you don't know it's it's there. I think. Yeah, it's harder to it's harder for women to access. Right, right. Okay, so you mentioned shaming before. Um, how big an issue is shaming when it comes to sexuality? Huge. It's huge. It's it is like the number one. I think in my book I call it the nastiest five letter word in the universe. It is like the number one issue. Like we, we, we have a, it's, it's almost impossible to open yourself up to true sexual pleasure until you work through the layers of shame that most people have. And, and most people have it, you know, it shows up all the time, all right. but it's such, it's such a hard thing to talk about that we don't even talk about it, right? There's so much shame mm -hmm. about having shame that you don't even talk about shame. Shame about having shame. That's, that's an interesting thing. Right? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting thing. I mean, shame about shame. Okay, <laughs> it's true though. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, otherwise you, you'd be able to talk about the topic. And, exactly. And, and I mean, culturally, good grief. I mean, culturally, this is this embedded in in a lot of cultures. I mean, I think, I think not just American culture. It's also in Eastern cultures. Like I think that's called the Christmas cakes in Japan, where uh, you know, for it's they're called they're called to women who are, you know, over the age of 25 and they're not married yet. So, you know, shame mm. is, it's, it's in a lot of cultures then, isn't it? It is. It is. In, it's in a lot, a lot of cultures. I mean, it, it, it's interesting because like ancient, ancient cultures, Alex, like way ancient cultures, the Hindus um, were very sex positive. The Greeks, mm. the Romans were very sex positive. They worshiped the goddess. They worshiped, you know, uh, there are statutes of like, uh, in in Sanskrit called penises are called lingams and vaginas are called yonis. There are, there are statutes of this all over Thailand um, and Asia, right? Uh, but, you know, West and, and Greece, but Western cultures are just had, you know, I guess it's a Judeo-Christian, <laughs> Adam mm -hmm. and Eve, right? They, they right, screwed right. it up for the <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we mentioned shame and we should mention abuse, but are there other factors which also cause women to shut down sexually? For sure. I mean, one of the biggest reasons that, in particularly in a long-term relationship, that women shut down sexually is um, having issues around emotional blocks with a partner. Mm. So if you're angry with somebody, if there's a lot of resentment that is built up, if there's a lot of expressed, unexpressed emotions and feelings, right, you know, right. women women tend to <clears throat> women tend to need to feel emotionally connected with their partner right. before they can open up sexually. Right. If you're pissed off at him or her, like you just don't want to have any part of sex, right? right, right. So 
so that's a very like that's a very very common pattern in in couples, right? We we have all this unexpressed anger. I don't want to I don't want to have sex with him. All right. All right. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Got that. Okay, cool. So now let's get on a little bit to the healing. Um, now I'm sure there will be those, um, those among our listeners who will be surprised that you awaken to your own sexuality age of 50 when yeah. a woman is stereotypically, you know, supposedly quote over the hill unquote, and that you're still a sexual person to date. So first off, what does sexual healing look like? Well, I think it's different for every person, you know, it, 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 nobody is going to be on the same journey as another person. But I mean, the first thing is like a having some self-awareness. Oh, I have an issue for me. Like, you know, at the age of 49, I was like, oh man, I got to deal with this. Right. right so for right. self, self-awareness, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and curiosity, like, okay, what's going on? I need to kind of figure this out. Um, looking for support or a way to be able to work through for me the layers of shame what one of the things that held me back were some early childhood experiences that i had that were not traumatic but they did cause a reaction in my body to Mm -hmm. sex where sex made me really anxious and when you're anxious sex can be really painful so understanding that piece of it whether you do that yourself read my book work with a therapist Mm -hmm. um and, and then, you know, starting to have some experiences around sex with somebody that you feel comfortable with, safe with. So, you know, sometimes I'll work with women to help them to start to experience, like, it's okay to experience pleasure in your body and just to feel that. Or you, you know, are dating somebody who is really supportive of where you are. You have to be honest and say, like, hey, you know, sex is sometimes problematic for me. Mm-hmm. I need to be with you. I need to be with somebody who can, like, you know, hold me through um, that journey. But there's lots of opportunities for women to be able to explore their sexuality in a safe way in, like, all female workshops that are Mm -hmm. given where you get to start to do some of this work. I think women very often need to be in a safe space, especially if they've had sexual abuse or they've had some sort of traumatic incident. So, you know, for me, Tantra, sacred sexuality was my doorway to sexual awakening and healing Mm -hmm. because a lot of the principles of it worked really in my favor. I didn't have to worry about goals. I didn't have to worry about having an orgasm. I didn't have to have any performance you know, issues and, and the, the partner I was working with was just like, this is just about your pleasure and, mm-hmm. um, and you don't have to give back and we'll just let your body heal in, you know, in the time that it takes and just slowly open up. And that's often what it feels like. It feels like, you know, you're a flower and you're very like a rose that's closed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and right. then the petals are starting to slowly and slowly open up. Um, as your body starts to feel safer and safer in in, in, in an experience. Okay. So um, with regards to benefits, so what are the benefits that, that occur when sexual healing does take place? There's so many. I mean, you know, our, our sex center for women and for men, but especially for women, is like the center of our power and our creativity. Our pelvic bowl is the center of our creativity and our power. Mm-hmm. And sexual energy is very, very potent energy. It creates life, right? Mm-hmm. Life force energy is one of the most potent energies um, in the universe. And so when we can start to connect with our sexual energy, we begin to actually transform our life. It's mm-hmm. transform transformative, powerful energy. Orgasm, orgasms are transformative, powerful energy. It gives us a lot more confidence. I mean, there's a lot of health benefits, right? Mm-hmm. It gives us more confidence. We sleep better. Um, we're much less stressed out. Stress is one of the things that really prevents us from, from feeling pleasure. Um, and we feel like we're in a much more powerful place. And when we connect with this energy, other changes happen in our life. We start like attracting people into our life and Mm -hmm. um, things into our life Mm -hmm. that we actually want to have. So it's, it's a very, very powerful connection. That's why, you know, I talk about an orgasmic life of being able to connect using the sexual energy to be able to bring into your life the things that you really want to have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, during this process, what sort of mental shifts are necessary to create uh, sexual healing or even a satisfying sex life? 
Yeah, so there's a bunch of different mental shifts that are that are necessary. I think, you know, for for most women, um, the most important mental shift is, first of all, to think about like, redefine what sex is, right? Mm -hmm. We just talk about sex being like penis, vagina, intercourse. No, right. not true, right? Like sex is anything that creates some sort of erotic feeling. Mm -hmm. It could just be holding your partner's hand and looking in their eyes or having a massage, right? So there's a lot of ways in which we can have sex. That mm -hmm. takes all of the um, expectations and performance anxiety about having to have an orgasm or make mm -hmm. my partner orgasm mm -hmm. off the table, right? And once that is off the table, you can be a lot more present in the experience. A lot of reasons that women struggle with sexuality and men, but especially women, is that we're in our heads. We're either thinking about our to-do list, we're not actually really present to, to our partner, or we're so worried that we're not going to come or that we're taking too long, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we're not actually allowing our body to relax, mm. right? And so that's another thing of like just learning how to get out of your head and be more focused on what sensations I'm actually having in my body mm -hmm. because that's where sex happens, right? Yes, our brain is a big part of, you know, sex, but when we're thinking, Thinking, we're not feeling right. and and sex ends when we're feeling so I think that's another big mind shift and then I, I also tell all women and all, some women are really shocked when I say this like you're actually responsible for your own arousal and knowing what you like mm. and so so many women rely on their partner and poor guys you know like guys are like god you know I don't know like it worked yesterday mm. <laughs> all right, all right. but it's just not working today and right. You know, we as women need to understand our body. We need to understand what turns us on. We need to know, understand what turns us off mm. and be able to communicate that um, to our partner, you know, so that they have um, some guidance. And I think when we start to understand our bodies better and are able to communicate it, and I'm sure you would agree this, like men want to know, like your partner yeah. wants to know. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and as, as speaking as a man, sometimes it gets frustrating when, as you mentioned, yeah, it worked yesterday, it's not working today. Totally. And that's because like, it, it, and this is, this is the bad news guys. And Alex, like women's arousal shifts from like day to day and hour to hour. What worked mm. yesterday didn't work today, which is typically different from men, but that's right. because like, we're so much more complicated. Our arousal system is so much more complicated since so much more of it is internal, yeah. right? Touch a man's penis, great, right? Yeah. Go to try to touch a woman's breasts or, or her clitoris, God forbid, before she's aroused, disaster. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> so it's really important to, um, yeah, it's really important to understand those differences and for a woman to be able to say like, hey, no, like I'm not ready. Well, that, you know, that, That'll feel good in 10 minutes, but could you do this in the meantime, right? Right. right. Okay, I got that. So, <laughs> so yeah, that, that clears up quite a few things for me anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, in the long term, you know, is it possible to maintain intimacy and sexuality over, over decades? I mean, like, say you got married in your 20s and 30s and at the age of 60, 70, you're still sexual with each other? Yeah, I mean, I know I know couples that have done that, and I know lots that haven't. Mm. Um, but I think what's important to be able to maintain long-term sexual relationships with a partner is like first and foremost communication. Like you got to be able mm. to talk mm. about what you like, what you don't like, what's working, what's not working. You know, talk about feelings, emotions, where you're feeling angry with each other, and be able to work through that. Right. Um, there's got to be, it, it, you know, I really think the most important thing is it's got to be a priority in your life. Right. You know, when you're first married and you're having kids, like no question, kids are the priority, right? right? right. This is this is where a lot of couples lose it. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it, it's in the it's in the kids growing up stage, right, mm -hmm. where they just stop having sex, which is what happened to me and happens to a lot of couples. So you sort of have to put it, you know, as a as a as a couple, you have to say, you know, sex is important. It's a priority for us. We've got to talk about it. We've got to make sure we put it on the calendar. You know, I mean, spont spontaneity is great, but it's not realistic in most people's mm -hmm. lives, unfortunately, right? right? Yeah. Um, you know, we got to put it on the calendar. 
we have to we have to change things up. We have to be curious. We can't do the same thing every single time. We're going to get bored of each other, mm. right? D domesticity breeds boredom. Well, the mm. same type of sex continuously breeds boredom as well. Mm. So making it a priority, being curious, being you know exploring new things, um, changing things up, exploring fantasies and role plays and being willing to push your edges, all are what allows a couple to continue to be able to stay sexual. Mm, okay. It's putting it, putting attention to it. Right, right. Okay, okay, right. got that. All right. So uh, let's say you came across someone who's realizing, you know, what the heck I have sex life or lack thereof do I have right now? Or maybe even you came across a guy who's wondering how to help his female partner with regard to sex, so to speak. And mm -hmm. uh, you had only enough to time her or him one thing about how to do so what would be that one thing you would say oh that's easy slow down slow down Just slow slow down slow everything down things go things move too fast women take 30 to 40 minutes to get a sufficiently aroused it's that's the truth right mm -hmm. and most people only have like 10 minutes of at most of foreplay mm -hmm. so slow everything down all right so really just take the time Take, take take the time and slow it down because you'll build up tension, right? If you go slow, you build up desire and you build, build up tension. If you go mm. slow, you're teasing your partner. Mm. And one of the things that makes great sex is tension, mm. right? Tension, where, however it's coming. So going slow allows you to build up that tension like, oh my God, like when, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? He's, He's going so slow, but your body is actually craving. And that's one of the things that really helps a woman, a woman uh, get to her arousal is mm. for her desire to kick in. And that happens when you can slow things down. Okay, okay, cool. So, uh, Jeanne, in the last few minutes of this, of this interview, are there any last words of wisdom you'd like to share to inspire our listeners? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think I'd like to say, like, if you're struggling with sex, like, don't give up. Don't don't think that you're broken. So many people and women feel like they're broken. You're not mm -hmm. that there's help out there for you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also like to tell people to really um, appreciate what you do have. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Like we are so focused on what we don't have. Appreciate what's working in the relationship and nourish those part of the relationship um, rather than feeling like you're opening up a Pandora's box. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, and um, I also want to say, like, you know, be really curious. Like there's so many different ways in which you can engage with a partner sexually. So be open to lots of um, different possibilities. One of the things in my book is there's probably 25 different exercises that tool, right, practices, little things that you can do for, to yourself or with each other. Like explore them, have fun with that, mm. you know, make sex fun and enjoyable it, it you know sometimes it's like intensely emotional and passionate and sometimes it's like yeah we want to have a quickie in our you know in our closet do it right. You know? right. okay cool fantastic so okay then thanks very much for those uh, last words and uh definitely uh definitely we should, we should check that try that out Yes, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So uh, in closing then, the book is Living an Orgasmic Life, Heal Yourself and Awaken Your Pleasure. The author is our guest, Janae Paylet, and you can find her book on Amazon. So Janae, thanks very much for being on Author Story. It was very informative. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. It was a lot of fun. Thanks right. for asking great questions. Ah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> So everyone, go ahead and check out Living an Orgasmic Life and go ahead to subscribe to our channel as well. So I'll catch you all next time on Author Story Weekly Interviews with another interesting topic and another great author.